Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now's a great time to grab your pens and weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already, because the service starts in 90 seconds. Welcome to Church Experience Online. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We are so excited about today's service. We believe this could be the most and best impacting hour of your week. Throughout today's service, you may have some questions, comments, prayer requests. Go to churchexperience.tv backslash connect or pull out your camera app and hit up uh, on our QR code to connect with us. Or better yet, if always, you want to know what's going on here at CE? Just hit the subscribe button right below. We love to hear from you, get back to you, and be praying for you. We are ready to dive in. Would you stand up with us as we sing some songs and worship to Jesus?
Father, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, would you meet us in this very place? Would you meet us right where we're at? Father, in our circumstances, in our relationships, in our struggles, Lord, meet us right there. God, we ask that your presence would be so, so real. God, we know you're moving. We know you're working. And we thank you for that. God, you're all we want. You are all we want, Father. God, we pray to just continually seek you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So maybe you have this friend that's a dog lover, and they got this overly aggressive dog. And the last time you went over to their house to hang out, this dog ran up on you right away, started licking your toes and your flip-flops, just giving you a bath, right? And then later on, you were sitting down at the table, and that dog hopped up on your lap, and it's licking your face, and that smelly dog breast all on you. And, but you don't say anything, right? Because you don't want to offend them. Because they love their dog, and so you're smiling on the outside, but you're not smiling on the inside. Because you're thinking everywhere else in culture, slobber is a bad thing, right? If you fall asleep in school and slobber on your desk, man, they're making fun of you. You show up to work and you got slobber on your shirt, man, they're, they're letting you have it, right? Because slobber anywhere else in culture is not cool. But for some reason, if a dog is slobbering on you, it's all good, right? And so your friend's dog is slobbering all over you, making a mess. But you don't say anything. You hide how you really feel because you don't want to offend them. So they're smiling, and the dog is smiling, and everybody's happy except you. And you don't tell anybody how you feel, and so nothing changes. The whole time you're there, nothing changes. And when you hide things in life, it prevents change from happening. It's a principle, it's something we know from experience, and almost every aspect of our life we've seen it play out. When we don't say how we feel, when we don't speak the truth, when we hide what's inside, things don't change on the outside. And some of us are stuck in our relationship with God, we're stuck in our life, we're stuck in our families, because we are hiding things. And because we're hiding, we're not seeing progress, we're not seeing growth, we're not seeing transformation. And so I've titled today's message, No More Excuses. No more excuses. I know you have reasons why you're hiding what you're hiding. But today my prayer is that God will use this message to help you step into the life and see growth and see change. You know, last week was Easter Sunday. It was Resurrection Sunday. And what an amazing weekend it was. I mean, it was incredible to see our services packed out, see people giving their lives to Jesus, kingdom impact being taking place all throughout our church. It was amazing to see what God was doing. But one of the things that was said from the stage, I, I heard it just, it kind of stuck with me. Someone said, hey, before you get comfortable in your seat, turn and make somebody feel welcome around you. And, and I, I love the idea of making people around us feel welcome. And I love the heart behind 
make yourself comfortable in your seat, but I, I couldn't help but think, and it really gave me a seed thought for this message today. I couldn't help but think about if we're too comfortable in our seats, if we're too comfortable in our seats when the preacher's preaching, then the preacher's not doing their job. Because God's word does not always make us comfortable on the front end. In fact, if a preacher's doing their job right, sometimes we're going to be uncomfortable when we hear the word of God because it's in that discomfort that sometimes God dislodges some of our excuses and our reasons for staying stuck where we are. And some, sometimes God needs to make us uncomfortable because it's in our comfort that spiritual apathy takes place. It's spiritual atrophy that, that causes us to lose our strength and lose our muscles, spiritually speaking. So God sometimes makes us uncomfortable. It's very much like an athletic trainer or an athletic coach. They'll break your muscle down in practice. They'll work you hard and they'll work out that muscle so that you can gain new muscle, so that you can grow, but it causes you to be stretched. It causes you to be uncomfortable on the front end. And today is one of those messages, I believe, that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable at times, but for the purpose, and we will get to the good news, but for the purpose of helping us grow. And get to where God really wants us to know. And there is all kinds of good news for us when we look at what God wants to do in our, our lives this post-Easter. As we think about what we celebrated last week in the resurrection, that was not the finish line. That was actually the start line of the church. And from there forward, we have a lot of work to do. But that work is soul work. And today, that's deep work. That's, that's doing the work inside of us so that God can do his work through us in the world. So Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to begin today. Acts chapter 4. If you want to power your Bible on and follow along with us. Acts chapter 4 in the New Testament, it's interesting, this, this passage in the parallel to what we just celebrated last week in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. It says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And I just want to stop for a moment and say, I love this, it says they continued to testify to the resurrection. What we celebrated last week so epically. And what an incredible service. One of my favorite services we've had in our short eight-year history as a church. It was just an incredible day. And it says that they continued to testify to the resurrection. We don't want to keep our praise and our proclamation of what happened at the resurrection to only be on Resurrection Sunday. It says they continued to testify to it. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is so central to our faith, that needs to be all year long. We continue to testify that we follow a risen Savior. You cannot find his body in a grave. You can go to the grave, but there's no body there. We follow a risen Savior. Our God is alive and active, and we worship him. We serve him, our risen Savior. And so we're going to continue all year long to testify to this, this risen Savior that we follow. And it says that as they did that, it says God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. And there, there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. They brought the money from the sales, and they put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field he owned and he brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. <laughs> There's so many supernatural crazy things happening in the early church. 
It's amazing. If you read through the book of Acts, the, the book of Acts is the, the acts of the early church, the acts of these apostles, the acts of these courageous leaders that are living out this resurrection story. And, and they're seeing these powerful things happen right on the heels of the resurrection. They're seeing these amazing things happen. In fact, in this, this story right here is the first time that the word church is mentioned in the book of Acts. The ecclesia, the gathered church. This is the first time that it's actually mentioned when mentions, is mentioned here in this verse that I just read to you. And now, greed may have been present for Ananias and Sapphira to do what they did. Others were selling property and, and donating the assets to God's work. And, and, and great things were happening. People's needs were being met. God's kingdom was, was going forward. His church was being built. And, and people were doing these radical acts of generosity. And so Ananias and Sapphira likely wanted to get in on that. They wanted to at least be perceived as being in on that. Maybe their heart really did, they really didn't want to help. But for whatever reason, they decided they wanted to keep back some for themselves and posture themselves in such a way as to, to present, hey, look what we have done. We've sold our property and we're giving everything. We're giving everything to God. We are all in, but they weren't all in. They were, they were one for you, God, and then one for me is kind of the posture of their heart. And they hid. The, the real sin here was, was deception. They lied. They, they lied, and, and he calls them out on it. He says, you've lied not only to people, but you've lied to God. Now, God knew what they did. When you lie to God, you, you don't deceive God. You, you don't actually trick him. He knows the truth. He knows the reality. But they, they presented this lie to the church, and so they presented it to God and to these others. And, and whenever in our lives we find ourselves hiding, we need to be aware that sin might be residing within us. Whenever we find ourselves hiding, it, it's, it's very possible that it's because that sin is somewhere residing and they were holding back and, and doing a good thing. They were trying to help others. They were giving money away. But behind this, there was hidden sin. They were, they were hiding something. They were hiding something. And, and, and sometimes these, these are indicators in our life that something is wrong when we start to feel guarded and defensive. We're short with others. We're not open. We're, we're hiding things. It's an indicator that there might be something else going on. Just like in, in your vehicle, when you see that indicator light, it, it lets you know that there might be something in the engine that you can't see that's not healthy, that's not, that's not working right, and it's going to get you on the side of the road broken down if you don't pay attention to it and repair it. And, and perhaps today will be one of those messages that the Holy Spirit uses to be a caution light, to say, hey, whatever it is that you've been hiding, whatever you've been defensive about, you've not been willing to talk about, that you've been defensive around, this might be something where God wants to work in your life so that there can be healing and so that there can be change. You know, some of you with your kids this last week with Easter, you did a little Easter egg hunt in the backyard, maybe around your house, and it's like been several days, been a week later, and you're walking through the house, and, and you look up, and you see on that top shelf, you see a little glimmer, and sure enough, it's one of those little shiny Easter eggs that you hid, <laughs> and it's still up there. It's still got the jelly beans inside of it, right? Because everybody looked, but they didn't see that one because you hid it so well, the kids never found it. And you'll find two or three of those that next couple of weeks, right? Because it was hidden so well. There's some things in our life that, that are, are hidden so well. Even a, a mature believer, you, you don't see it. It's, we call it a blind spot. You don't see it. And sometimes it, it takes a matter of time. Sometimes it's, it's a perspective of someone else that you allow close to you. This is why I love life groups. We experience life together. You allow other believers to get close to you, connected to you. Right? We're not just sitting in rows. We're getting in circles. We're connecting with each other. It's so important because sometimes people see things in your blind spot that you don't see. And we, we need to be a part of the church, the, the gathered church, the ecclesia. It's great to watch online. It's great when you're sick or out of town. But it's something important about being together, gathering together, allowing other lives to come in contact with your life. It's just so critical. It's mission critical. And sometimes it's God, the reading of God's word from a preacher or in your own time alone with God. And I hope you have daily time alone with God. You need more than 30 minutes on Sunday. You need daily time alone with God because his word is living and active. And it, and it reaches into places in your soul that you can't see. And it exposes our excuses inside of us, those hidden things inside of us. And we're so good at, at hiding in our comfort, aren't we? We are. We're, we're really good at hiding in our comfort and our excuses we're good at denying the truth, and, and we're really experts at defending what we really want to do. And, and this, is, this is why it seems like such a harsh story, right? When we hear about Ananias and Sapphira, we're like, wh why is this such a harsh treatment? Like, why does God strike them dead because they're lying? I mean, they're doing a good thing. They're helping somebody. And, and, and the reason why this is such a, a stark and contrast between what happened and the results that happened, the consequences, it's because we are really numb to sin. We're really numb because we have our own excuses. We have our own reasons. We are experts at justifying our sin. 
Well, look, I mean, they, they were doing some good things too, right? I didn't lie. I just didn't tell the whole truth. <laughs> right, but it's, it's deception. It's hiding. And, and, and here's a foundational lesson I'd love you to write down today. What we excuse in the dark, we see different in the daylight. What we excuse in the dark, we will see different in the daylight. And my hope today is whatever you have been excusing and rationalizing your way around in the dark in your life, that God will bring that into the light, that you will step into the light and you will see transformation, you will see change, and you will see growth in your life. Where are you tempted to run and hide in your life? What are you tempted to defend when people get a little close and they point out, hey, I I think I see something hiding in your life. I think I see something that you missed. What do we get defensive about? My, my challenge to you today is to, going to be to bring that, even though there's tension in that moment, bring that before the Lord in prayer. Bring it to others in conversation. Talk about it. Let the Holy Spirit work in your life. He, he has given us his word and he's given us his Holy Spirit. And these two things are, are great gifts to us from the Lord. His, his very presence through his Holy Spirit to convict us. As believers in God, it tells us in his word that the Holy Spirit is inside of us once we receive Jesus into our life. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict us. And so we know as believers, when we start to get off path, something doesn't feel right. But it's not just our feeling. It's not just the conviction. We can, we can measure that by the written word of God. And if our feelings ever uh, contradict God's written word, we know our feelings are deceiving us. Right? Because God's written word is his, his pure standard. It's his holy standard, his set-apart standard, and we, we fall short of that. We do, but that's how we know where the standard is. It's his written word. And sin is such a big deal because it entangles our life. It, it has consequences, but yet we, we, we cover over our sins. We hide them, and so we never, we never change. Maybe you've gone to your, your teenage son before, and you say, hey, do you mind taking out the trash? And could you please take out the trash? And they, they go over to the trash can. They see it's pretty full, but they take their hand and they, they shove all that trash down in there, right? And, and they say, oh, there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty of space, Mom. There's plenty of space, Dad. We're good. But then later on that day, the, the trash is starting to fill up again. And so you go to your same teenage son and you say, hey, could you please take the trash out? And they go over again and they try to smush it down a little bit. They got a few more inches. They just shove it down in there. I think we're good. We're going to be good till tomorrow. <laughs> and you let them get away with it. But you know the reality is this. The reality is that at some point, you can't push that down anymore. You can't shove it down anymore. But the more that you compact that trash, the heavier it's going to be, the more chance that that bag is going to break when you carry it out to the trash bin. You know that eventually it's going to start to smell, and you know that if you don't take care of it, it's going to overflow into the rest of the house. You know, our sins are very similar. We, we, just, we try to hide them. We bury them with our excuses, with our reasons. This is why it's okay. This is why it's not a big deal. This is why I'll get to it one day. And we hide behind our excuses, and we keep hiding and burying these things in our life. But the problem is, over time, this problem will spill out into the rest of your life. That burden will get heavier with time. It will break and tear some things in your life, and eventually it will smell. It will cause your life to smell. It will leave your life in ruins if you don't handle the problem underneath the surface. Throwing a little band-aid over the infected wound isn't going to heal it. You need to treat the source. You need to take out the trash in your life by bringing it to the light. How do we, how do we take out the garbage in our life? We, we bring it into the light. We bring it into the light. First John chapter 1, take a look at God's word in verse 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him, and we declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God has nothing to bring into the light because God has nothing hidden. There's no hidden part of God. It's not like, you know, one day you're going to discover something about God. Oh, no, I didn't know that. I can't really trust God anymore. No, like he has nothing hidden. There. He's completely trustworthy. He's true in everything that he says. It says, in him there is no darkness at all. Verse 6, if we, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Because God is light, and there's no hidden thing in him, and there's no sin or imperfection in God, when we walk in darkness, we create a gap between us and God. When we sin, we rebel against God, we go a different direction, we create distance between us and God. God loves us. God is still true. God is still loving. His posture towards you has not changed in the sense that he loves you and cares about you. But when you walk in darkness, you create distance between you and God. And God wants us to walk in relationship with him, but that requires us to walk in the light, 
to confess our sin, to go and sin no more. But it takes courage to tell the truth, right? It takes courage to step into the light. It's not an easy thing. It takes courage. We'd rather run. We'd rather hide. We'd rather hang out in the darkness. But the opposite of, of courage is fear. And the reason why we don't have courage to step into the light is because we're fearful of our sins being exposed, of not being able to measure up to that standard. And we fear what could happen if we step out of the dark and we don't have darkness to hide our, our, our failures and our frailties anymore. But the other side of fear is trust. We want to learn to trust God because he is trustworthy. And when we trust God to step into the light, we're trusting that God will work it out, that we will be loved, that God will, will care for us. He didn't come to condemn us, but to save us from our sin. And we can trust because we know that we are loved. And God says, for, for you are loved, for God so loved the world. He, he gave, he gave his son for us on the cross so we can be forgiven of our sin. So love drives out fear which allows me to trust God, which gives me the courage to face my fears and to step in the light. Here's the lesson. I was so loved in the dark that God called me to live in the light. You were so loved in the dark. He loved you, as it says in Romans 5, while you were in your sin, while you were spitting in the face of God and rejecting him and rebelling against him. While you were at your worst, God showed that he was at his best. He loved you and gave his son for you while you were in that slimy pit. When you were stuck in that hole of sin that you couldn't get out of, God reached out his hand in love to forgive you if you just come into the light. He loved you so much that he didn't leave you in that hole. He says, go and sin no more. I want you to change. He didn't, didn't just love us and put a stamp on the way that we live and say, it's okay, I love you, stay where you are. He said, no, I love you enough not to leave you where you are. I want you to change. Go and sin no more. What do we know? How do we know what sin is and what sin is? It, the scripture tells us that. God's word tells us real clearly what sin is. It's his written word. It's the standard. It's so important. But he loves us so much that he gives us a standard and he compels us to walk in that, to live in the light. And so we want to shine a light in our life. Here's what I'm getting at. We want to shine a light on anything that's hidden in our life. We want to step into the light and anywhere that we find ourselves hiding from God. And when you're drowning in the dark, we need to know that our help is always in the light. I want to draw something today on the blackboard uh, that, that I hope will, will be a, a visual for you that you will always remember to help you live this out, right? Especially when, when the road gets hard because we know that in this life, the road is, is not easy. In fact, Jesus told us this. He said that this road is hard. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. In fact, he called this, this road that we walk on, he says it's the narrow road as Christians. This, this is a narrow road. There's a broad road that leads to destruction, right? The, the broad road is the easy road. It's do whatever I want, wake up, and however I feel, that's how I'm going to live. But we know that that road, the worldly road, the sinful road, that we know that that leads to hell. We know that that leads to judgment. We don't want to walk that road. But the narrow road, to live a life of holiness before God, to live for him, to be set apart is what holiness means. To live that road, we know that that's hard. And because that road is hard, a lot of times we find ourselves falling off this slippery slope <laughs> into a much, what seems like an easier path. It's an easier path, and we find ourselves on this because it's, it's easier on the front end. It's a shortcut because we, we can do what we feel like doing. We can, you know, let ourselves slide a little bit because that's what exactly what happens. We slide off the hard road and into this little, little, little easier road, the low road. And the, the problem, though, in this road is we, we never get where we really want to go. We, we see where we want to go. We see the, the end point. We, we never get there, though, and we have all these <laughs> these barriers that we come up against. And it's not just the barriers that we constantly hit our heads against, like these, these rocks in, in the road. It's not just that. It's that when you're living a life outside of God's purpose for you, then the storm clouds really start to form. And man, when it rains, it pours. Because when you're living a sinful life, you don't always see it up front. It's not always like it outside, but, but it's, it's in your mind. It's in your life. It's in your home. There's, there's consequences for our sin. And we're always banging up against these obstacles. But we can never get up to where we want to go, get back on the path of life and move forward. We can never get back up on that path, primarily not just because of the obstacles, but because of what these obstacles represent. The reason why we never change. And that's our, our reasons. Our, our, our reasons are what these rocks really are in our, our life. And, and, and these, these, these walls that we have constructed with our reasons, with our excuses, they keep us from moving forward. And they're the reason why we stay stuck and we, and we don't go back because it was a hard road. And maybe we try, but we keep falling into this. And so what, what is our hope to ever get out of this, un, un, out from underneath these, these thunderclouds? Well, well, God's given us this thing called confection, confession. And he's thrown us a rope down into the pit that we're in. And it's, it's called confession. Confessing our sins and, and coming into his 
light. And when we come into God's light, man, it, to stand in his light, it is a humbling thing because our sins are laid bare, our vulnerability. We have to be authentic and say, hey, look, I, I am not perfect. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And, and it's hard to come out and confess your sin to God and to others and say, man, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm weak. But when you do that, that's when life transformation starts to happen. That's where you get back on the right path and God can take you where you need to go. But when you're stuck here, it's hard because you, you literally are stuck between a rock in a hard place. And this is where some of you are. This, you, you're drowning. You're drowning in the storms that you have created. And, and, and the waters are rising all around you. And you see the consequences. But you can't go forward because of all these reasons, all these excuses. Well, well, this is why. And this is the problem. And here's why I find it hard. And you can't live this, this life on, on your own in your own power because you keep sliding back into this sinful life. We've fallen short. And the only way out to live on this, this sunlit path and to get where God wants us to go is this, this rope that God has thrown us in the pit we find ourselves in, and it's called confession. Coming into the light. Coming into the light so that God can bring healing and God can bring transformation and God can bring hope through Jesus, our risen Savior. Come into the light and see God work in your, way, in your life in ways that you can't even imagine. But we get stuck in the dark because of our own reasons and our own excuses. And that's why I titled this message, No More Excuses. Because my hope is that you'll leave those excuses behind. Acts chapter 5, I'm going back to this story again about Ananias and Sapphira. The reason why they found themselves in this mess that cost them their lives, their future, was because of, of their reasons, their, their excuses. Acts chapter 5, look with me again at verse 2. It says, with his wife's full knowledge, Ananias kept back part of the money for himself. For himself, self-interest. What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? That, that's really behind a lot of our, our biggest excuses, why we don't fully serve the Lord, why we don't honor the Lord and give to the Lord and give of it our time, our talents, our treasures. We hold back because we want something for ourselves. We're still protecting ourselves. Now, we don't protect the interests of God because we're too busy protecting ourselves, and, and he wanted something for himself, so he kept back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. So he did a good thing, right? This is what it looks like on the outside. He wrapped his, his acts of goodness in a pretty shiny wrapper. He sold a property like this other gentleman did, and he, he gave it, he gave, gave away these profits, except for he kept some for himself. And he had reasons. And maybe his reasons were, were good reasons. Well, I need to save up for retirement one day. I need to keep something for myself. I need to keep something for my kids and my grandkids. And, and he pulled back, he held back, and he protected what he wanted. And he had his reasons for doing it. But his sin was that he hid it. Because later it says, wasn't it your property to do with what you want? Couldn't you have done anything you wanted with it? But he held back and he hid from God in this, this moment. And his deception is what caused him to get stuck. His deception, not, not coming into the light with his, in, in honesty, with, with what his intentions were. I mean, it would have been one thing to come and say, you know, I sold this property and I wish I had the faith of this other gentleman. I don't have that kind of faith to give everything. But I'm going to give what I can right now. I'm going to give something. That would have certainly been much better than hiding and pretending and put on this facade of generosity when in reality there was greed under the surface. Right? And, a, and a sin of deception and hiding it is what causes problems. We don't come into the light. You know, and around our house, I, I try to spray for bugs about once a month or so. And, and, and I don't do it because I see bugs all over the place. I do it because I don't want to see bugs all over the place. So I have a, just a, a rhythm, a discipline of spraying for bugs. It's because of my wife, really. Because my wife, if she, if she sees a bug, like around our house or in our garage, we have our laundry out in the garage. One time she was out doing the laundry and, and she, she put her hand inside something and it was clean. And, but there was a, bu a bug inside there. It was a big bug and it freaked her out. And she screamed, man, that gave me a heart attack because she screamed so loud. It's like I, I don't want to re relive that moment, right, because she, she screams, man, she see bugs. So I, so I spray. But, but man, you, you know about the thing with, without bugs, you, you, you might have bugs around your house and you just never see them because they come out in the dark, right? I mean, palmetto bugs and cockroaches, they, they, they come out in the dark, right? I mean, if you've got any around your house, in your garage, outside, I mean, they, they come out at night when you don't see them, when you're sleeping. But when you turn the light on, they scatter, right? Because, because they don't want to be in the light, so they scatter into cracks and crevices and under surfaces. And, and, and our sins, we do the same thing. We, we, we run and hide. We don't want to come into the light. But it's when we come into the light, it's, it's when we're exposed, we feel vulnerable. 
But that's where the, the life change happens. I'm telling you, that's where God wants you to be. Even though you're tempted to run and hide under every crack and corner and, and run away from this, this moment of confession and revealing before God, confessing to him your sin, confessing your shortcomings. I know we want to run and hide, but that's the exact moment where the greatest opportunity exists for us to grow, to stretch. It's uncomfortable, but it's in that moment. Whatever it is you're thinking right now, I don't want to confess this. I feel uncomfortable. Or you start to give those reasons. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in this, oh, this, this way around the side and around the, the corner. I'm not going to make it public to God. I'm, I'm going to hide it still. These excuses, these reasons keep us from growing. And they keep us from growing when we ignore them, when we deny them, when we hide from the truth. Sometimes it comes in the form, we don't want to talk about it. We put walls up. My spouse says to you, you know, I notice you have an anger problem. I notice you're impatient sometimes. And they say it in their way, but you know what they're, they're getting at. And I don't want to talk about that right now. Those walls, are, we're hiding. We're hiding. On the other side of that is a good conversation that could actually lead to change, that can grow that relationship, that can improve that marriage, can help you to be a better parent. But we, I don't want to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm not going to talk about that with you. It's, and, and so we never grow. We never develop. Sometimes we even boast about it. I don't care. That's fine. I, I don't care. That's, that's who I am. That's, that's, that's how I am. I've always been that way. And we're arrogant about it. And I want to remind you of James chapter 3, verse 14, if you ever find yourself in this spot, where it says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Do not deny the truth. But don't boast about it either. You know, we tend to justify our sin, excuse ourselves out of obedience, and we have reinforced our, our self-deception with justification. We'll justify it with our reasons, we'll justify ourselves, we'll rationalize our way around it. And so we hide behind all of these excuses why we are, why we're not living like we see other people living for Jesus. Well, here's why. We have all kinds of reasons. We hide it in a pretty wrapper. Our family was at a zoo one time, and we were looking inside this little aquarium tank, and it had these beautiful colored frogs, but they're poisonous frogs. And I was, I was locked in because these things were beautiful. I, I wasn't even sure they were real. And they, they weren't even hardly moving, but they were these amazing colors. And this woman came up next to our family. I'm, I'm staring at these, and, and, and she, tells, she could tell that I'm really fixated on them, these poisonous frogs. And, and she says to me, well, I'm not even looking at her. I'm looking at this. She goes, you know, it's always the pretty ones that are poisonous. <laughs> and so I'm like, who is this woman? We, I, I look over, and, and, and she has a grin on her face, and I know she's not talking about the frogs. Right? It's all these the pretty ones that are dangerous. I know she's not talking about these frogs. But, but you know, the, this, the danger is the, these pretty wrappers that we sometimes wrap our sins in. You know, we make it sound good, we make it look good, but the reality, man, that, that will destroy your life. It's toxic. We like to hide it. And, and, and then when God calls us to confess our sin, to step into the light, we have all kinds of qualifiers. All kinds of things that we feel like we need to add to justify and, and give our reasons and measure out the why and excuse ourselves. Here, here's what I'd like to say to you. Don't, you don't need to qualify your confession. You don't need to qualify your confession. I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I failed. God, this was wrong, and I'm sorry. Not I'm sorry, but if we're still giving excuses, it's, good, it's, a, it's a good indicator that we have not yet repented from our sin. If we're still giving excuses, no more excuses. God, I, I was wrong. I'm sin. I'm a sinner. This, this is a blind spot in my life. Forgive me of my sin. There's such healing in that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Don't, don't trust your own judgment. You need, you need God's word. People get themselves in all kinds of a mess trying to reason and, and, and think through, well, this is what I think is right. This is, the culture is saying all kinds of things are right right now, which are so far outside of God's plan for us. They give it all kinds of reasons why. It must make you feel guilty on the other side. Well, if you, I can't believe that you would be so narrow-minded to think this. And that, that's why we have God's word as our written standard. This is how we know the difference between right and wrong. It's not our reasoning. It's not what popular culture says. It's not what we read on the internet. It's, it's what God's word says because our hearts are deceitful above all else. I'd imagine Ananias and Sapphira, you know, in their thinking, they had reasoned, well, we're, we're doing a good thing. One for God, but then one for us. One, one for you, God, one for me. We're, we're taking care of your interests, and we're also taking care of our interests. It's a win-win situation. Perhaps we should be most concerned about partial obedience in our life, maybe even as much as complete disobedience, right? Because when you are outside of the will of God, you are exposed, and you know that you're walking in sin. And in that, there's always the hope that you will come to your senses and repent. But when we partially obey God, perhaps we should, of course, obedience is always better than disobedience, but we should be concerned about partial disobedience, the kind of obedience where, like Ananias and Sapphira, they were partially doing the right thing by helping others, by giving to God's purposes, bringing their resources into God's kingdom. But 
the partial disobedience is we're going to hide. Hide behind our lies. We're going to get some for our own. And, and when, when we sometimes obey God and sometimes do what we really want to do, we risk never changing, never coming into the light. Because we do enough to kind of appease our conscience, but we never actually walk in the light. And so we never change, we never grow, and we never experience the life that God wants us to live. Now, I've been a surfer you know, most of my life now. I started when I was a, a teenager, and I've surfed in nine different states, surfed in some great places. I'm not a great surfer, but I love to surf, and I've enjoyed it a lot, and I've been out in the big waves many times. And, and, and what I've realized is this, it's always easier to surf the shore break than it is to surf out in the big waves. The big waves are harder to catch. It takes more skill to learn. I love riding the big waves, but it's a lot of work. Sometimes you have to fight past some significant shore break to get out to the big waves to surf, but that's where the long rides are. That's where the good rides are. But you know what a lot of people do, especially when they're learning, they stay in the shore break. But you know it's actually more dangerous to surf the smaller waves in the shore break because, because you're so close to the ocean floor. If you fall and you hit your neck on the bottom of the ocean floor, I mean, all kinds of dangerous things can happen. Right? I mean, you don't know what you're doing, I mean, it's, it's so much more dangerous as those waves crash on top of you there in the, in the shore break and the, the crash zone. I mean, there's just so much that could happen that's bad. But, but we look out and we say, well, that's such a big mountain. That's so far out there. I got to swim all the way out there. I'm just going to surf right here. I'm going to take it easy. But sometimes it's that, that easier road, that shortcut that's actually much more dangerous than taking the hard road that might seem difficult on the front end, but it leads to life in the long run. You know, Ananias and Sapphira here, they... They were partially in for God's interest and his purpose. They partially wanted to be generous, but they, they were hiding, they were covering up their, their hidden greed. They still wanted their own and wanted some for them, and they wanted to be perceived as generous, but in their heart they were still greedy. And, and people do this with their giving too. You know, they kind of move money around and, and do funny things with their money and kind of cover it up, and the, but they'll put on that front of like, oh, I want to give to God, I want to tithe, and this is how I'm going to kind of give to God. But in the reality is they are not bringing their tithe. They're not giving their first tenth to God through his church as the principle and the pattern that we see in God's word. They're not giving their first tenth to God through his church. Instead, they're finding other ways to justify how they're using their money primarily on self and self-interest. And, and when we use excuses like, well, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And so I'm not really cheerful about giving this amount to God, so I'm going to give a lesser amount. But the verses like that were never given to us to excuse us out of giving joyfully. They were actually given to expose in us when we are not feeling joyful about giving. There's something wrong when, when we're not excited to give to God. We're not excited to give to his kingdom. It should cause us to ask, why am I protecting? Why am I wanting more for myself than I'm wanting for God's kingdom? To see people come to Christ, to see God's church built, to see help needs met by people. Why, why is it that I'm holding back? You know, when, when God convicts us, as he did here in this situation so clearly, when, when God brings things, into the, brings things into light in our life, we have to be quick to respond. You know, I talked about, you know, it's been a lot of my life in the ocean, and there's been so many times where I've, I've seen waves, you know, come up on the shore, and, and, and you're, you're looking down, and you might see a, a beautiful shell, or you might see a rock that you want to pick up. And, and, and I, what I've realized over time is there's been so many times where I've seen something in, in the bottom of the ocean floor that, that looked pretty cool, and, and I wanted to reach for it, but I paused just long enough that that next wave came and washed it away, and then it was gone, and I never saw it again. And I've realized that you have to act quickly when you see that opportunity before the next wave comes and washes it away. And I think the same is true when the Holy Spirit convicts you and you see something in your life that you're hiding. You see something you're defending and hiding between. Like, this is something that's, this, 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 this is mine, God. This is mine, like Ananias and Sapphira. God, you can have some of my life, but I'm going to hold back part of it. When, when God starts to convict you, you have to be quick to respond if you want to grow. Because those excuses and those reasons will come like the waves that are endless. And they will wash away that moment of conviction. And you'll find yourself sliding back right to where you were before. What we need to do is in the moment of conviction, quickly step into and grab hold of that excuse. Bring it before the Lord and say, God, I want to walk in the light. God, I want to live for you. And here's my reasons. Here's my excuses. But I trust you. I want to live for you. Let the Holy Spirit bring conviction because where there's conviction, there's eventually healing. And so here's my final question for you today. What am I holding back and why am I still hiding? Right? Why am I still hiding? What, what are you holding back? What in your life are you holding back from the Lord? What is he convicting you on today? What area of your life are you like Ananias and Sapphira? God, you can have some of my life, but I'm going to hold back part of it for me. Maybe it is in your finances like this specific story was. Maybe there's some of us who God is convicting us in this area. He wants to do more for his kingdom. He wants to help more people in need. He wants to move his church forward, but some of us are holding back. Maybe it is that. But I'd imagine that there's an even bigger group of us that's other areas in our integrity, in our morality, 
in our choices, in our family, in our faith, where we're holding back and we're saying, God, I'll give you part of my time. I'll give you part of my passion, but God, I'll hold him back. I'm going to make sure I live a comfortable life, and if I can live a comfortable life, then I'll give you the leftovers. And God's saying, no, no, that's not enough. That's not how we do it in the kingdom of God. You seek first the kingdom of God. You put my interests first, and I will help all those other things come together in their own place in the right time. Seek first God's kingdom. A lot of us have buried our sins under excuses and hidden them behind walls of denial, and God is saying, come into the light. And, and I hope that he'll remind you today that just like Jesus was buried in that tomb, you might feel sometimes buried under the sin in your life and, and buried under the weight of the consequences of your sin, like you drowning, drowning in that thunderstorm that's created by your choices. And I want to remind you today that no matter how much you feel buried, just like Jesus was buried in the tomb, there was a resurrection. And there was a resurrection. Our Savior was not buried and dead and gone he, forever. He, he rose on that third day and he came to life. And he showed us that there's life for all who look to him. And no matter how far you've drifted from God, no matter what it is in your life that you have walked away from God on, if you will step back into the light, God will forgive you. He can resurrect what has died in your life. He can bring life back in your faith when you feel like there's no life in your faith. God can change and transform and restore and renew and rebuild whatever you bring to him. So my challenge for you today, church, is to bring to the light whatever is hidden. Whatever it is that you're running from, bring it to the Lord. Run to the Lord. Bring it before him and see God do a miracle and see him bring transformation. I want to close with this word of scripture that I want to read over to you today before I, I pray, and it's from Ezekiel chapter 36. And this is what God wants to do in our lives today. We talked about how that our hearts are deceitful. They are, they are wicked on our own. We are without hope. But God's word in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, it tells us, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. My prayer today is that God will renew your heart today, that he will make all things new as you step into the light. Right on. Right on. Come on, let's pray together, church. God, we, we thank you so much for your light, your radiant and beautiful light, God, that shines on us. Thank you, God, for the light of your truth, the light of your word that, that lights the path before us. Thank you, God, for the light. God, we confess, though, that we are sinners, and so often we have walked in darkness. God, we've walked in dark ways and hidden ways, and we've, we've hidden from you, just like Adam and Eve from the very beginning. They hid in the garden. As soon as they sinned against you, they ran and they hid. And God, we confess today that we have done the same. We've so often hidden from you and we've hidden from others. But God, today I pray that, that God, you would, through your Holy Spirit, convict us to step into the light so we can see change and we can see growth. God, we want to continue to testify to this amazing resurrec resurrection of Jesus. And through our lives and how we live and honor you, God, we want to testify to the world. We want to be that light on a hill. But God, we know that for the light to shine through us, it first has to shine in us. And so, Jesus, may your resurrection power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, may it raise those, those dead and hidden things in our life. Raise us into the light. God, restore and renew and rebuild and make all things new. God, the, the old has gone and the new has come. So, God, may we confess and no more excuses, no more reasons to keep us stuck between that rock and the hard place. But, God, may we take that, that gracious rope that you have given to confess our sins and be pulled up into the light as you are in the light. God, today as we continue to pray, I, I know that there's things that your Holy Spirit may be impressing upon us. And if that's you today, you feel like the Holy Spirit is convicting you of some area in your life that you need to bring to the light. I want you to do that right now first to God. First to God. I, I want you to confess to him and, and say, God, here, here's my sin. And perhaps you're not walking with Jesus today and, and you need to confess that you are a sinner. For the first time and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior to save me from myself, to save me from my sin. Confess your sins to him. Receive him into your life today and say, Jesus, I believe in you and what you did on that cross. I want you to be my risen Savior, not just a risen Savior from history. I want you to be my risen Savior. I receive you into my life. God's word tells us that those who believe and received him, he gave the right to become children of God. And you can pray that prayer right now and receive Jesus into your heart and life. Be forgiven of your sins. Be adopted into God's family. But many of us in this room, you have, you have things that are hidden in your life, and I want to challenge you to confess those things to God as well and say, God, here's the specific thing that the Holy Spirit is bringing to light. He's shining his spotlight on me today. It's not comfortable, but I know when there's discomfort, God, that's a good thing because it's causing me to grow. So I'm confessing this to you. I'm coming to the light. I want to change today. Bring that to him in prayer. And while you're doing that and while you're praying and bringing that to the Lord, I just want to remind you that God will meet you there in the light because God is light. And he will help you through it. But he, he has a, a journey, a path for you that he'll light up to help you. He'll help you know what those next steps are.
And as you're praying and thinking about what those things are today, I just want to let you know that, that it probably involves including others in that process. Don't try to do this alone. Confess your sins to someone else around you. Confess to someone who believes in God and believes in you can help walk you through into the light. To help hold your hand through it and put an arm around you and give you that extra strength you need to make those changes in your life. God, we thank you for your church, the ecclesia, the gathered church. We thank you that we can be together. We can support each other. We, God, we thank you for how your church is growing throughout the world. We thank you for how lives are being changed through the power of the gospel. Jesus, we thank you for your word and your truth. It's light for us. It lights our path. And God, I pray as we go forward in this week, God, we may see clearly every step of the way what you want from us so we can honor you and live for you. Walk in the light and be a shining light to this world. It's in Jesus' powerful name that we pray. Amen. Well, church, before we prepare for a final song of worship today, I just want to let you know next week we're going to begin a brand new teaching series called All the Feels. And we're going to talk about how we navigate our feelings and our mindset and how we can bring our, what's in our mind before the Lord and allow God to bring transformation in our minds and where we struggle, where those biggest battles are in our feelings and, and the different things that we face trying to be healthy in our minds. And so I encourage you to be here with us. Bring someone with you. It's going to be a great week. Hey, let's get ready for that final song of worship. Before our usher team comes forward to receive our tithes and offerings and response cards, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. Jump into a life group or serving team. It's a great way to make friends, to grow in community, and to serve one another. There are many opportunities available to make a difference for the Lord and build great relationships with others at the same time. Check the life groups or the serving teams bubble on the back of your response card to learn more. As our ushers come forward to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, God is the ultimate giver who gave the most precious gift imaginable, his son Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Our lives are transformed because of Jesus. When we learn to give generously, it changes us, making us more like our generous Father. The Bible says that everything we have comes from Him. So, when we give, it's actually returning to God what belongs to Him. We are putting God first in our lives and trusting Him to provide for all of our needs. On behalf of every life that is changed because of your generosity, thank you for faithfully giving to God through church experience whether in the worship service, through our website or app, or by mailing in your giving. Your generosity is life-changing for so many people who are experiencing a full life in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being on mission with us to help more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ.
I had the best time today worshiping and learning with you. You may have made a commitment during the service. We'd love to have you reach out to us. If you have any questions, comments, prayer requests, go to churchexperience.tv backslash connect or scan the QR code on the screen. Want to get even more connected? Check out our CE social media, Instagram, Facebook, website, or app, or go ahead and hit the subscribe button right here. What a great day it has been. Can't wait to see you guys next week.